it's time to start actually looking at adding some textures and shading to this object. But first we've got to finish off this cupcake holder because it's not actually filled at the bottom or anything yet. So uh, I'm going to make a, a backup connection. Um, we're going to put the duplicate of the, the cupcake holder before we apply everything in there. And I'm also going to put the original icing sort of remeshed version in, in there as well. So I'm going to take this outer edge, extrude, and then we want to make it a circle if possible. So there's this really neat add-on called Loop Tools, um, which comes with Blender. You just have to uh, enable it in your preferences. It gives you all these options for sort of relaxing, um, relaxing topology, making shapes out of it and that kind of stuff. It's really useful for turning things into circles that are irregular shapes. Just going to inset a couple of times and then do a merge at center to make a triangle fan. Then uh, you'll notice the edge is very sharp where it goes towards the floor um, because we're not adding any subdivision surface modifier here. Um, so what we're going to do is actually just bevel it um, and add, use a scroll wheel to add a few cuts until you can't see the faceting um, and we'll just do it like that instead. And then at the top here, um, I'm actually going to add a, another loop um, going up towards the top. And the reason for this is we're going to add a solidify modifier now uh, to give it a little bit of thickness. And if we don't add that loop, you see the shading gets really weird at the top um, because the normal sort of wrap around like that. So I'm actually just going to add it, you know, another edge loop as well. We can see that the, uh, the scale of the whole cupcake is about three meters, which isn't very accurate. So I'm going to uh, use the comma and set the uh, pivot point to the 3D cursor and scale everything down, just looking at the dimensions on the right there, until it's about, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate, as long as it's roughly in the right range. You can see now if we apply the scale, uh, a bunch of things break. Our displacement scale breaks and our solidify modifier breaks. Um, and the reason for that is just that the uh, there's a couple of attributes on the displacement modifier that depend on scale being correct um scale being at one when we when we make things much smaller the effect of the displacement is going to be much larger um, relative to that we're going to apply those modifiers before we apply the scale uh, to our cupcake mesh layer and then we can apply the scale no problem uh same goes for our well for our uh, cupcake holder we're actually going to have to adjust the value in the solidify modifier because we want to keep that procedural so we'll apply the scale adjust the solidify number in the uh in the modifiers tab there until we get something that that's correct so you can actually just uh, type in math operations in there so i usually just divide it by 10 or here i'm going to divide it by seven and now we have everything at an applied scale so now we're going to start to uv map our object um, and this is just going to allow us to essentially uh, bake down any textures that we do at a later stage if we want to um, you don't want to learn how to do this step that's fine because uh, in this case we're actually going to be using procedural coordinates anyway for this so we won't need a uv set to texture this for the, the cupcake holder here we're going to add some seams basically uh, you want to think how would i cut this up if it were made of paper to uh, sort of paint on it and the way you would do that is by uh, cutting the uh, one down one of the sides so you could sort of unfold it that way and then selecting everything unwrap you see you get this uh, in the uv editor which you know is pretty good and the next thing to do is the cupcake base and the uvs are a little bit weird here they're just sort of uh, altered cylinder UVs so I'm gonna first cut the bottom and then I'm just gonna mark a seam up the top there to cut and then just unwrap it like that and we could minimize stretching here but I don't think it's too bad given that you know it's quite it's not really that visible and um, in order to do that we'd have to add more seams that would be more visible as well for the icing I'm gonna uh, cut off the bottom again and then I'm gonna just sort of take one of these these loops that go around uh, and then make sure that I go all the way up to the top there and select a loop around the top as well and mark all that and that should give us a decent result 
but you can see there's a lot of weirdness going on where it loops around back on itself and that kind of thing. And the only real way to remove this is by adding another cut um, laterally on the object. So we're gonna, I'm gonna use the control click method to sort of select the shortest path between two edge loops in edit mode. Um, mark another seam there where I, I don't think it's gonna be too jarring. And then I'm gonna unwrap that and we get a much better result here. I think this is gonna be acceptable for our needs. Um, you could definitely do this a lot better, but I'm just sort of looking for a fairly quick solution that isn't overly time consuming and it will work perfectly for baking textures down or anything like that. So now we're going to go into rendered view and make sure we turn off scene world. Um, so we get the default HDR to like this and we're just going to start uh, adding some materials to objects. Uh, it's also a good time to name everything now at this point just to stay organized with it. Um, so let's start with the icing. Uh, I'm going to actually use an attribute called pointiness on the geometry uh, node. And what this does is basically uh, where there's a sharp edge, the value goes up to one and then where it isn't, it's close to zero. So from there, I'm going to plug it into the uh, mix factor on a uh, mix RGB node. Uh, plug that into the base color there. And then we're just going to sort of look at making uh, some chocolate icing here, I think, but you could do whatever color you want, really. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to select this sort of dark brownish color. Um, going to look at some reference as well for this part it's really important to get the colors right um yeah and then i'll just copy that color over and, and sort of make a lighter variation of it for the for the b input and you could play with the, the contrast a little bit there as well um realizing it actually isn't that shiny which is interesting so i'll turn the roughness a fair bit up as well um and now this looks pretty bad at the minute but it'll look much better once we start to add some bump and and that kind of stuff to it um, really will sell it. Another thing that we uh, that we're going to want to add as well is some subsurface. So uh, this is essentially the effect you get when you shine a bright light behind your fingers and you see the sort of the, the red glow. It, it happens really on anything organic where you get some light scattering inside the actual object. So we'll turn that up a little bit. And then for the displacement, I'm going to start with a Voronoi texture because looking at references, there's a fair few like small little circle circles that um, displace it. And this is where you see the UV map could come in useful for um, for this part, but you see where we can see the seams quite clearly where we've cut it. So instead I'm going to use a texture coordinate node and use an object input. Um, because we're doing this all procedurally we, we're, we can do this no problem. And then I'll set the mode to smooth F1, play with the scale, I want it fairly, fairly dense. Now we're just going to look at taking this distance input and converting it into our height. So we're going to put it into a, a height input of the bump node. And we can see it looks pretty bad. So there's a couple of things we want to do. The first thing we want to do is stop it going to sort of ridges. We just want the sort of low points. So to do this, we want to uh, sort of clip those, those upper values with a color ramp. So uh, if we add a color ramp here, you can see that we can sort of stop the, the values going too high and we just get those little circular indents. Um, but they're very, very intense at the minute and also have quite a linear fall off. So to change that fall off, uh, we can add a float curve. Make sure you add it before the color ramp because the values will be from zero to one there. Um, and we can, yeah, we can really play with the, with the fall off of this quite a bit and the sort of size of the holes there as well. Um, and then I'm just gonna multiply this whole thing by a very small number, uh, 0.01, just so it's much less, it's much more subtle. And then I'm gonna add another multiply node, multiply by 0.2 again, just to tone it down even more, because uh, yeah, even multiplying it by 0.01 isn't enough. So there we go. You can also hold shift on any value to to scroll through it more slowly. So that's looking pretty good as a first pass. Um, and then we're just gonna layer up more uh, more displacement basically. So we're gonna layer up a noise texture here. And we're gonna add that on top. Actually, let's set it to, yeah, let's set it to add. Then 
bring the scale up a bit. Uh, it's really useful for stuff like this where it's really sort of small to, to bring the detail and the roughness up. Um, but not too much or it becomes so small it's barely noticeable. And then we j I'm just going to add those two multiply nodes in again to tone it way down. And then we get a really nice sort of uh, uniform bump across everything. And it just catches the light and gives us that impression of roughness. I'll just set that to 0 0.001 and then set that to 0 0.3 so I, I get a bit more control on the second multiply there. I can just sort of play with how intense I want that. But you can see it's, it's actually a little bit too uniform for, for my liking, so I'm going to add another noise texture with a much larger scale. Um, it's going to be much broader, and it's essentially just going to be a control for how intense the bump is across across the icing. So uh, where this where this noise texture is white will be the strongest areas, and where it's black will be there'll be less bump there. So yeah, I want I want something fairly uniform but broad. So something like that, adding a color ramp, you know, just to control the contrast there, uh, and then I'll just multiply that on top of the um, on top of the other noise we have. And this right now is uh, essentially turning it off in some areas. So I'll, instead of that, I'll just bring that that black up to 0.5 so that it's never got no bump. It's just got maybe half strength bump or a third strength bump. I'm going to add now another Voronoi texture um, and pretty much copy the setup we had for the first one sort of add it in as well and um, just for some larger larger scale holes um, and then I also decided to change that noise to multiply everything not just the noise texture so that the actual bumps would would be affected by by two so the bumps wouldn't always be the same depth And then I'm just going to take that that small uh, Voronoi texture and uh, use it to control the color a little bit better as well, I think. So I want basically the color to be a little bit darker where the indents are. I'm going to make another mix RGB node and use that mask as the factor there. And then sort of copy the base color into there. But as you can see, actually, we need to flip the inputs around because right now our color is affecting the majority of the object. We want it to affect only where the, where the little dents are. So yeah, we can add another color ramp to control the contrast again and just make the color a little bit darker. Uh, I'm also going to set it to, to take from the float curve node so we get the nicer fall off too. And yeah, we get some, get some darkness there. It might be a little bit too intense, so I'll just lighten it up a little bit, that color. But I think this adds some really nice natural variation. Uh, if you want to as well, to simplify it, you can actually add a RGB node. Um, so we don't have to input three colors manually. We can just sort of input uh, one here and then use that to control the uh, the color of the dimples by plugging it in there and then just in between adding a hue saturation value node, decreasing the value a little bit. Um, and you can sort of control the strength just using that factor there. That's a little bit of a nicer way of doing it. So now if we want to change the main color, we just change that one color on the node. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the icing. Um, it looks fairly complicated, but like I say, it's just a few different effects laid on top of each other. Now I'm actually going to copy and paste a bunch of these nodes because this overall sort of displacement look of the art that we have on the icing here, I think with a little bit of tweaking we can use for the, um, the actual cake itself. So actually just going to bulk select these nodes and control C them. Then in our cupcake shader, I'll just paste them in and do a little bit of tweaking. I uh, maybe tweak the, the fall offs a little bit there and tweak some of the scales as well. Uh, set this to be our sort of chocolatey base color. And then I want this to be fairly shiny, actually. Uh, we also want subsurface on this too, because again, it's an organic material. 
So I'm just going to solo it by pressing the slash on the number pad and just sort of look at uh, different subsurface values here, uh, different scales. I'm also going to use a noise texture and a color ramp just to influence the bump a little bit there, uh, just so it's not perfectly uniform across the whole thing and just uh, making it fairly high, high detail noise and keeping it fairly shiny with that black value on the color ramp. Now for the cupcake holder, this is supposed to be a sort of translucent paper-like material. So for this material, uh, we're going to use the pointiness attribute again to influence a couple of different things. Um, firstly, the color, um, because in a lot of the reference I've seen, um, because it's translucent, you get a lot of the color of the actual cupcake coming through on the points closest to the to the cake. So just using the uh, the same technique here with the pointiness, we get that nice mask. Uh, set that to ease so it's not perfectly sharp. Um, and that's a nice nice mask for our different colors that we want. So I'll set one to be a dark sort of chocolatey color, give that illusion. And the other one I'll keep white. And now this isn't looking very good because we need to actually make it somewhat transparent. So we can do that with the transmission attribute there. And then with the, uh, in our render settings, make sure you actually turn off caustics in the light paths because that will slow you down quite a lot. Um, yeah, and keep your values, the value for your white fairly high um, because it's very sensitive to, to dark values. I'm actually going to just tweak the shapes a little bit here so it comes up a little bit more, tapers in a bit as well maybe. Yeah, feel free, free to still tweak your geometry at this stage. It's not quite matching what you had in mind. Um, using proportional editing again, you know, pressing O, really helpful for, for actual cupcake base here. I'm actually going to add a circle in um, to make some little star shapes uh, on the top as little decorations. Uh, so I'm going to add, I want a five point star, so I'll add a 10 point circle because uh, we need double the amount of points so we can scale every other one in. Make sure your pivot point set back to medium, just with the comma menu there. Uh, and yeah, just fill the star in. Now, uh, this is where using an engon, in my opinion, is fine. We could quad fill this fairly easily, but really don't think it's necessary. Just because this won't be subdivided and uh, we don't, we want it to be shaded fairly flat anyway, so it's not really a concern. And now I'm going to give it a little dark material once it's in position. A little chocolatey, dark, shiny material there, turning the roughness down. Now you can see the edges are way too sharp at the minute, so I'm going to add a bevel modifier. And because we're working at such a tiny scale, we actually need to turn the amount really, really way down. It's practically impossible to do it manually, so you have to. Um, Get it as low as you can and then just divide it by, keep dividing it by like two until you get, until you can start to see the impact of it. And for me, uh, three divisions, uh, this tiny scale works pretty well, so I'm going to leave it like that. Now, to distribute these, we could do a particle system or some sort of geometry node setup for this, but uh, I find myself just fighting those systems quite a lot to get the result I want. And... You know, it's not going to take too long, so I think I'm just going to manually duplicate the star up. Um, I'm actually going to use Alt D when I duplicate these, so that the uh, that way the geometry stays linked. So if we did want to say convert these to quads later, if we needed to do that for some reason, we could because if we went into edit mode on one, it would change all the stars at the same time. But I'm also using the 3D cursor here. I'm just shift right clicking where I want to put a star on the surface. The cursor will snap to the surface. Then with Shift S, I can snap the selection to cursor. So in terms of our render setup here, the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, create the backdrop we want. You know, looking at how real life photography of, of products is done, um, the way that they they do an infinite backdrop is actually just sort of like uh, almost like a cloth that drapes down and has a nice nice curve to it. Then I'm going to add a camera and set the camera to view, 
and just sort of position it around. I want to rotate this cupcake, so I don't want to rotate everything individually, so I'm going to grab all the stars, uh, parent them to the icing with Control p uh, Object Keep Transform, and that way, uh, now whenever I move the icing, the stars will follow it. Then I'll do the same, I'll parent the icing to the cake, and the cake to the cake holder, and that way I can move the cake holder, and the whole hierarchy works, everything will follow it. So now I can just spin that around a little bit, and now I'm going to start lighting. So uh, the first thing I want to do is make sure I'm using the scene world, because that's what we'll see in the render. Uh, and then I just want to set the world to black, because I, I want to add all, this light, all these lights manually. So the first thing I'm going to do is add an area light here, and just sort of start positioning it uh, somewhere realistic. And there's quite a lot that goes into lighting, but for now I think for this product shot we want to just Keep, keep it fairly simple, minimal amount of lights. Uh, big lights create softer shadows, so we'll, we'll set the light quite big relative to the cupcake. Then I want to color the backdrop a little bit and give it a sort of pastel-y orange type color. I think that goes quite nicely with the uh, with the chocolate. You can explore a bunch of different colors, but I found this one works pretty well. Uh, and it also depends on what, what colors you went with on your cupcake and that kind of thing, but this usually works quite well for product shots. And then if, if you find things are blowing out a bit too much, you can decrease the intensity or pull the light out a little bit. But, you know, make sure you don't underlight your, your product here. Now that we have our, our key light sort of in, um, we, we quite like the angle that that's coming in at. Uh, to get more of a, a studio feel, uh, we want to add another light uh, coming from the other side that's going to act as our, our sort of fill light. And this will just uh, make make the shadows so they're not quite so dark. Um, and I actually want to tint this light to be a little bit blue, uh, just to contrast with the all the orange we've got going on in the scene. Another thing we can do to improve the realism here is uh, enable depth of field on our camera, because what we're rendering is so small. This will have quite a big impact. Um, it'll just you know blur everything that isn't isn't in focus, make it behave like a real camera more. It's quite subtle, uh, but I just do think it adds something, and if you if you push the camera in closer, it becomes more obvious and that kind of thing. So it's always worth doing that. Just turn this down a little bit. Uh, our backdrop, I, I think I want to scale it up a little bit, actually, because I do want to see a slight line the horizon. Um, so it's not a perfect infinite backdrop, but I think it adds a bit more realism. Then I'm just going to add one more light that's it's a little bit, a little bit angled up um, towards the backdrop, so it's not really affecting the cupcake. It's just lighting the backdrop a little bit, so it's not so much in shadow. And then yeah, I'll, I might move the camera in a little bit, do anything we want to now. And because we've used an empty to set the focus, we never have to change any of those distances. It all works pretty nicely. You just pick your angle, take a render, and you're pretty much done.